Oh man, I love this game. So glad it's out now. Wait a minute. This game is out now. Which means it's December. I didn't start my Christmas shopping yet! Season's greetings, my wonderful viewers, the Green Scorpion here, in a bit of a Christmas pickle. But I have a plan. When in doubt, steam it out. Mileage may vary depending on how good their PC is, but if you have family or friends who play games, what better gift is there than sharing an experience you can talk about for years to come? But you can't go breaking the bank. Video games are expensive. Never fear, my frugal followers, for today I've compiled a curated collection of economical choices. Specifically, games under $10. It's a nice way to send some holiday cheer to one of your online buddies, or pressure your friend into finally playing that game you recommended. Steam has a huge library of older classics and indie titles, so to take it one step beyond, all of these games are under $10 maximum, base price. That means before they're on sale, because sometimes AAA publishers like to keep their games on permanent sale to pretend you're getting a deal. Think of it this way, if these games fit into your budget now, just wait until the Steam Winter Sale starts knocking percentages off of everything. I can smell the savings! Oh, and the Christmas cookies. So to celebrate the season of giving, these are my top 10 Steam games for under $10. Let's get started. New Year's Resolution 2019. I'm gonna finally publish my top 50 favorite games that I promised on Patreon. I'm working on it. It did make a good starting point for this list though. All I had to do was check if any of the top 50 fit the $10 bill. And sure enough, every Portal game is on here. I would mention Team Fortress 2, but since it's free, it doesn't exactly make a generous present, does it? The first Portal game is a short experience but really broke new ground upon its release, cultivating a huge fan base and helping Steam gain notoriety in the first place. Portal 2 is a much fuller experience with more puzzles, more story, more characters, and even a two-player campaign. I decided to list both games since you can pick up either one for $9.99, and most definitely less since they pretty much live on sale. But Sir Scorpion, you ask, if these are among your all-time favorite games, why are they only number 10? Because they've been around for so long that everyone's heard of them. Frankly, you should have played them already. But if you know someone who hasn't, seize the opportunity. These games have great visual design, inventive physics puzzles, and your friend will finally hear all of those famous quotes in context. These games belong in the library of any PC gamer. For science, no cost is too great. But 20 bucks would be pushing it. Might as well get them on sale. Let me get my other obvious choice out of the way. Undertale. Undertale's a lot like Portal in this regard. It hasn't been around as long, but in its three-year existence, it got a lot of exposure, turning downright mimetic. Maybe a little overrated, maybe some fans blurt out the quotes without respect to what makes them so funny in the first place. Yeah, there's some parallels here. At this point, you've likely either played this game or decided you're not interested to. But, I bet you know someone who barely knows about it yet. A little cousin, maybe? A friend living under a rock? Someone who says that they don't like RPGs because they take too long, or says video games are all violent and stupid? Even if the game is best played blind, I went in knowing some major plot details, and to me at least, that didn't make them any less effective. There's a debate to be made over whether or not the turn-based menu combat is actually fun, and grinding for that super hard boss fight certainly wasn't. You know the one. But the joy I had playing this game is nothing compared to the joy I had thinking about it. Listening to the soundtrack, talking to other players about theories and interpretations, trading stories about accidental kills and reactions to certain reveals. If that's not a good reason to buy someone a game, I don't know what is. I mean, don't shove it down their throat. If they're not interested, they're not interested. But if you think they might be, it's a low investment for what could be someone's life-changing experience. But then again, it might not be. You've probably already decided. And that's why it's number 9. Time for something a little more underground. 
You don't see a ton of budget fighting games nowadays. Most of the time, if it's under $10, it's because some newer version of the game has replaced it. I'm not gonna buy someone an old edition of Skullgirls. How about an indie fighting game without bells and whistles? Heck, without characters! This is where Nidhogg comes in. One of the most addictive two-player games I've ever played. Here's the concept. You and your opponent engage in a fencing match. One hit kill. You can hold your sword at three different elevations to stab the enemy or block your opponent's stab. The two of you frantically prod and parry until one of you falls. Then the winner gets the arrow and has a short time to run as fast as they can through the level until the loser respawns. Fight again. First person to push forward all the way to the end wins. It's as simple as that. The balance is perfect. I mean, you and your opponent have the same abilities, but it's surprising how much strategy comes out of this simple moveset. You can try jumping over your opponent, rolling under them. You can even throw your sword, which can be a major upset, but really screws you over if they block. And if you do impale them, do you take a moment to pick up your saber, or do you sprint to make as much progress as possible before they come back? The trades are super fast, as both players get twitchier than Fox and Melee, but this isn't Final Destination. The different courses actually add a lot of layers, from breaking bridges to backgrounds that obscure your weapon. Sometimes you both come to a door and just stop for a moment, trying to read each other. Do I open the door or do I let them? God knows what he'll do if I open it too slowly. Nidhogg has that same rapid, one more round gameplay similar to the likes of Duck Game, if you've ever played that, though a little less expensive. It's low stakes, but you'll really want to win. There's actually a sequel, but they went for a more 32-bit graphics over the Atari-like look of the first game, and I think it lost a lot of its charm in a transition. Personal opinion? Buy the first one and while away the hours killing your special someone online. While Steam is my favorite source of indie games, it's also great for resurrecting older games that you might have missed on consoles. You know, unless it's a terrible port. Fortunately, the HD port of Beyond Good and Evil is a worthy vessel for a game that a lot of people missed out on. This passion project hit the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox in 2003 with paltry sales. Maybe it's because it wasn't part of an established franchise, maybe because it had a girl on the cover, maybe because it had to share its release window with games like Jack 2 and the original Call of Duty. But I think it's some combination of the three that left it so criminally ignored. We open on the planet Hillis as it prepares to defend itself from the invading aliens, the Doms, only for the Defense Force to be immediately decimated. A few years later, the Hillians have just accepted the invading aliens as part of the climate. Everyone lives under energy shields for protection from Dom's raids, and if you don't pay your electric bill or the government misplaces your payment, your shield goes down and you're utterly helpless. You play as Jade, an investigative journalist who also happens to run a shelter for kids orphaned by the attack. But you gotta pay the bills, so Jade takes a job to gather information on certain government officials, which slowly uncovers a conspiracy between the Hillian government and the attacking alien threat. To tell you any more would spoil a pretty good story, but I can at least tell you that Jade's uncle is an anthropomorphic pig named Paige. And he's awesome! Like many action adventures of the time, Beyond Good and Evil jumps between many different playstyles. Jade can fight with her staff when she needs to, but her real weapon is the camera, used to capture the truth hidden from the populace. There's also your battle-ready hovercraft, which is able to reach more and more areas of the game as you unlock upgrades from the Rastafarian Rhino mechanics. Yeah, this game is weird, but it has so much personality. If you miss these kinds of 3D adventures, think Star Fox Adventures is a little underrated, and want to unfold a captivating plot with one of gaming's best female protagonists, track down this lost treasure. Maybe we can get more people excited for the sequel Ubisoft says they're working on. I know there's a trailer with a surprising amount of swearing in it, but I won't believe it until I'm actually holding the game. Or playing it on Steam, I mean, whatever works. You wanna talk old? Let's party like it's 1999! I think we can all agree now that Sega lost the 16-bit console wars, but the benefit of losing is that there's no expectations of you anymore. So why not take your entire library and dump it onto Steam? All of the best first-party titles of the Genesis are there for you to enjoy for 99 cents a pop. Can you believe the Wii Shop channel wanted 8 bucks for each of these? There's some great games hidden in here too. Shining Force, Shinobi 3, the Streets of Rage series, Gunstar Heroes, Golden Axe, Rise Star, not to mention all of the classic Sonic games. So which one do I choose? I was leaning more towards Vector Man or Sonic CD, but I think this entry needs to be Sega in general. Granted, if you want the whole collection, the whole thing's gonna run you about 30 bucks, 
but you could easily pick out half a dozen favorites for way under budget. Sega didn't stop with the Genesis though, you also have some of the best of the Dreamcast in here. I especially want to highlight Jet Set Radio and Crazy Taxi, both endlessly enjoyable. Sadly, no skies of Arcadia. If only someone cool were doing a Let's Play on them. Wait a second, Comic, I told you to stop putting plugs in my scripts! Anyway, it's refreshing to see such a well-preserved and expansive museum of games so readily available. Makes me miss the Nintendo Virtual Console. You can get an NES or SNES Classic, I guess, though it's only a limited collection of games for way more money. Or you wait and hope Nintendo remakes your favorite GameCube games. Now I'm not saying that every Sega game is a hit, some of them really don't hold up in my opinion. But it's here if you want it. It took 20 years, Sega, but you finally did something Nintendo didn't. I get a lot of people teasing that I should put Honey Pop on this list. No. I'm not picking something that gratuitous. The number 5 isn't too far off if your mind is twisted enough. 100% Orange Juice is a virtual board game with elements of deck building, RPG combat, and Kawaii Desu Anime Girls. Why the name though? The developer is called Orange Juice, and this game is... 100% made by them, I guess? Actually, it's a crossover with characters from all their previous games, none of which I've ever heard of. A lot of indie crossovers lately, huh? I keep expecting Shovel Knight to show up. 100% Orange Juice has a single player story with the cutesy characters trying to figure out what's happening. But this game is best experienced as a 4 player party game, because the AI freaking cheats! You move your character around the board, activating cards and rolling dice to collect stars, win battles, and power up to level 6. Each character in this massive cast has their own attack, defense, and evasion stats, plus a unique special ability card. And occasionally you'll run into monsters and have to battle them in a mini RPG encounter. It might sound like a lot, but the game's actually extremely fast-paced, meaning you're never waiting too long for your turn. This might be a problem for new players, there's no in-game tutorials, so you'll need a friend or online guide to help you make heads or tails of this insanity. It's a game of making intricate strategies, and then throwing them out the window when RNGesus rears his ugly head. And if it sounds like Mario Party, I assure you that this is just as certain to reduce your number of friends, especially if someone plays Mark, f***ing sniping me for 5 damage from across the board, taking all my stars! I thought this was a unique aspect of Mario Party, but now that I think about it, all board games are friendship enders! It's totally worth it though for all the comebacks, the upsets, executing players when you know that they can't evade, the karma next turn when you land on your own trap. It's a hectic, godless game of chance, totally worth buying for your friends, just don't expect them to be your friends much longer. Nowadays you can't go 5 feet without hitting an indie game. Each year, a dozen little studios come out of the woodwork with a game that redefines its genre. But I remember when the concept of an indie game was still new, back when Minecraft was still in beta. That was when it blew our minds that Cave Story and Braid could be made by just one person. Indies were around, I guess, but they weren't nearly as accessible as they are today. Then, in 2010, Xbox Live made its big play in the indie crowd with this little classic, Limbo. No, not the game where you bend over backwards to get under a stick. This is a game where you die, and die, and die. Limbo isn't a hard game like Super Meat Boy or Celeste, it's a fairly simple puzzle platformer. But it also has some light trial and error to it, and a lot of vivid ways to end your life. Yeah, this game's a little dark. I wouldn't say it's overly adult or anything, you don't see any blood or gore or any adult themes. It's just very nonchalant about showing a small child dying in some pretty gruesome ways. That's not why I like the game though, I'm not that sick. But, well, in a weird way it helps. Super Meat Boy and Celeste make you feel great for overcoming a challenge. But something about Limbo... I feel great for overcoming this darkness. This cold, unfeeling world. There's not really a story, though sometime we should trade our interpretations on it. You're just moving toward any small bit of light you can find. It takes me back to my earlier gaming days, where I didn't need a story to go right. I just went right. Limbo doesn't have the mind-blowing meta moments that all indies think they need to have now, but it's not self-important or aggrandizing either. It's just a short game that does what it wants pretty much perfectly. And it's got this really cool spider. That really, really wants to kill me. Gruesomely. Merry Christmas!
3D platformers are back, baby. Super Mario Odyssey, Crash Insane Trilogy, Spiral Reignited, A Hat in Time, Ukulele. I mean, Ukulele is kind of disappointing, but that's okay. I'm just so glad the genre is alive and well. But now that I think about it, are there any other 3D platformers coming out? Please tell me this wasn't just a brief resurgence. Well, if you finished all of those and you need your fix, look for some games that you might have missed. Chances are, you missed Psychonauts. This is one of those games everyone's heard of, but few people have actually played. And why is that? It's so affordable on Steam. Psychonauts puts you in the shoes of Raz, a psychic commando in training, and the minds of everyone around you. Through telekinetic links, the subconscious of every character becomes a sprawling 3D world full of obstacles to overcome and figments to collect. What a great idea! Classics like Banjo-Kazooie had to invent lovable characters and imaginative worlds, but in Psychonauts, the characters are the worlds, and each colorful castmate combines imaginative action set pieces and hidden backstory that gives you a new insight into their behavior. Everyone's got emotional baggage, here represented as actual luggage, and your life bar is measured in mental health. This game's wordplay is next level. You got the drill sergeant whose psych is filled with dangerous war flashbacks, or this lady who... I don't even want to say, you just gotta try it for yourself. It's all from the mind of the crazed genius Tim Schafer, who also designed Grim Fandango and Brutal Legend, two other amazing games I recommend. Schafer excels at world building. These games are so different in aesthetic and theme that you'd never link them together, until you listen to that snappy dialogue. What they don't expect is Raz, the Psychonaut. And, and, and then you'll make their heads explode? No. Do you do that? No. Well, once kinda. Yep, that's Tim alright. And that's Richard Stephen Horvitz voicing Raz, the same guy who voiced Invader Zim, Billy, and Chaos from Skylanders. That should be enough incentive right there. Or if you don't care about the voice work, just know that you can set squirrels on fire with your mind. How have you not played this yet? If the point of Steam gifting is to give a friend a game they might not have played, then let me share a game that surprised me. Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight. I didn't know much about Momodora before booting it up. Nothing about its genre or characters, or even that it's an ongoing series. Reverie is actually the fourth Momodora game, but it's also a prequel that stands on its own. You certainly don't need to play the others before this one. First of all, look at these graphics. I've gotten used to seeing creative pixel art, but I've never seen anything like this. This is beautiful. There's no outlines on anything, the animations on the creatures are so smooth with particle effects and movement blur, and while everything blends together naturally, the sprites are big enough that I never lost sight of my enemies. It's like if Miyazaki made a Commodore game. This priestess here is your main character, Kaho, who slashes at enemies not with a sword or a knife, but with a leaf. Power of nature, I guess. She also has a bow, a dodge roll, and a number of collectible items she can equip. Reminds me a lot of Hollow Knight, actually, and I love that game. Similar to Hollow Knight, Momodora is a hardest stone metroidvania that really nails the atmosphere. In this case, there's a bleak hopelessness to this dark blighted land, but there's still so much color and ambience that you can tell this world used to be vibrant and lively. There's something here worth fighting for, and with tons of item combinations, there's a lot of ways to tackle these larger than life bosses. The first time you fight this giant witch, you'll know whether or not this game is for you. And if you ask me, it really is. At least if you like a challenge and a rewarding story. Again, I'm gonna stay tight-lipped on this one. Highly recommend for fans of anime, melancholy fantasy, and freaking good side-scrollers. The last decade or so has been such an interesting time for gaming. The medium is at an age where people who grew up playing video games are now designing their own. Naturally, many indie developers use their talents to make homages to the games that inspired them in the first place, and with a modern, more advanced understanding of how mechanics work, they can, in many cases, surpass their idols. Just look at Stardew Valley, which both captures and refines the Harvest Moon model, or A Hat in Time, which did a better job recreating a Banjo-like experience than the team that actually made Banjo. All of those great games from the 80s and 90s, someone is working on a spiritual successor, and with all this passion in the industry, it's a wonderful time to have a curse. One of my most anticipated games of next year is Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, promising the best alternative to Castlevania since Konami decided that they didn't like making money anymore. Bloodstained did very well on Kickstarter, meeting a stretch goal to create a smaller prequel game before Ritual comes out, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. 
now available on Steam. While Ritual will follow the path of Symphony of the Night and other classic Metroidvanias, Curse of the Moon journeys back further to emulate those tricky NES platformers, particularly Castlevania 3. Except I didn't need a Xanax after playing it. Look at these sprites! It's so unmistakably Castlevania! But the colors and detail pops way better than they ever could have back then. Your lead character, Zangetsu, fights with a sword. That's pretty different. But like in Castlevania 3, you can recruit a trio of companions to play as instead. Miriam is much more your traditional Belmont with a handy dandy whip. Then there's Alfred, your mage character with a variety of spells, and Jeebel, your Alucard stand-in who turns into a bat. The different playstyles and your ability to swap on the fly gives you a lot of options, and there's all kinds of hidden nooks and crannies to explore. Or, you can stick with Zangetsu and kill everyone else. Yeah, this threw me for a loop the first time I played it. You can go full on genocide, and it's not as stupid as it sounds. Each slain hero grants Zangetsu a new ability. So, do you want to play as all four characters, a fully powered Zangetsu, or somewhere in between? Throw in the more difficult nightmare mode, and this fairly short game just got some serious replay value. That's something that the original Castlevanias never really had. It was so hard to beat them the first time, I never really wanted to go back once I was done. But it's how Bloodstained differs from its forebears that makes it so special. The difficulty is... really not that bad. It still gets hard in places, especially if you want to do everything, but you'll find the game's much more fair with its challenge. Knockback is only a thing if you want it to be, enemy placement isn't as cruel or arbitrary, even little quality of life things, like these candles. Any old school player can describe the headache of losing your preferred sub-weapon because you accidentally picked up a lesser one. But in Curse of the Moon, the candles are different colors depending on what's in them, and the sub-weapons that drop depend on what character you have currently chosen, so you have a lot more control over your inventory. This makes things so much easier! So, bottom line, if you're a fan of Castlevania and lament its absence, play this game. And if you've never played Avania and want to get your feet wet, play this game. It's a much kinder first step and equally fulfilling. And if you want to burn some time while waiting for Ritual of the Night, definitely play this game. Support an indie developer and start getting excited. Give the gift of hype for Christmas. So, that's my list. And yes, I checked it twice. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. I mean, if you still haven't finished your Christmas shopping, yeah, your options are kind of limited. Luckily, you won't have to spend time going to the store or picking out wrapping paper. Just click a few times and BAM! You're now Steam Santa, delivering hidden gems from amongst the coal. And maybe a few not-so-hidden gems. Don't feel too confined by my choices either, it's not like these are the 10 definitive best games. Just a place for you to get started. There's a full sleigh of choices here, many of which are going on sale. The important thing is that you know your friend, and you know what they like. It's the thought that counts, not the savings. But how good are those savings, seriously? I am the Green Scorpion, wishing all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Alright, now back to Smash Brothers. <laughs>